sit down, sit down, sit down. Nice to see you guys. A couple weeks ago, Andy, uh, Andy popped in my office and said, hey, would you cover one of the James series? I said, yes. Which one? He said, pride. <laughs> and you know, guys, I, I wish, this is just one of those topics I know nothing about. So I'm just going to have to not speak from my personal experience. No, as I mentioned pride, I know what some of you are thinking. Man, I wish Becky was here. She is so full of herself. This would be the night that she would really hear it and be challenged. Or we all have that friend in mind that we know they're arrogant, they're snobby, they're stuck on themselves, they're always overly promoting themselves. We follow them on social media, but mainly to judge because they are so into themselves. And you go, this is the night, maybe I'll send them this message. And if you were excited about the idea that we're talking about pride, a problem you don't have, but someone else has, I have some... I kind of have some good news, bad news. Here's the good news. If they're not here, the person that needs to hear it, good news, that's not the message we're gonna talk about. The bad news is the message that we're gonna talk about from James on pride is the message we all need to hear. Because um, we're not talking about conceit or snobbery or all that other stuff. That's a sort of, well, that's a sort of pride that costs you friendships. That's not the type we're talking about. We're talking about, from James, the type of pride that separates you, not from people sometimes, but from God for eternity. So let me just be 100% clear, just so that we're all on the same page. The type of pride that we're talking about tonight is not the cocky, full of themselves, snobby person that's always self-promoting. We're talking about the kind of pride that creates a wedge, a barrier between us and God that doesn't cost us friendships, but costs us eternal life. So do I have your attention? So tonight what we're gonna do is we are in the fourth chapter of James, feel free to find it. We're in the fourth chapter of James. We're going to define, since I am using pride in a much more full-blown, robust theological way, we're 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 gonna explain what that kind of pride is and tonight, we're going, to, we're going to look at the evidence. How do I know that if that kind of pride is in me? Because this is really important stuff. If this pride is in me, I'm in trouble. So how do I even know? So we're going to look at some, some evidence that could give way that that's a real deal inside of us. Then we're going to look at an example. Because James gives like a little case study. We're going to look at a little case study. And then we're going to answer the real question. And this is the reason you came tonight. What do I do? What do I do about this? So... That's your outline already in case you want to know, hey, how far are we into it? Just remember those four things, which some of you forgot, but you can ask your neighbor a little bit later. So let's look at the verse that mentions pride in James 4. And this is James 4. This is the last half of verse 6. James writes this, and he's writing this not to non-Christians, but he's writing this to people who say, hey, I am a Christian. He's writing this to church people These are people who are steeped in the Hebrew tradition. So they were like super Christians of their day. And so he says this, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Now, this passage right there, if you look at it, if you're looking in your Bible app or you're looking in a Bible, you might see there's a little notation that says that, hey, by the way, this is in Proverbs 3. Proverbs is an Old Testament book that deals with how to grow in wisdom. And so what James is doing is a figure of speech that's oftentimes used in the New Testament where a reference is given, but it expands outward. So the person would hear the reference, but really, as soon as the words were spoken, they would hear something much bigger than that. So for instance, in our culture today, if I were to say, may the force be with you, what comes to mind? Star Wars, right, yeah, exactly. A whole franchise, half of which is garbage, some of it's good, right? What, what, what? No, okay, uh, where, this is not audience participation. I, I, will, I, will, that, I get a little easily distracted. You should know this. I sometimes get myself a little turned around. I'm not looking in that direction. So, <laughs> may the force be with you opens up Star Wars, right? So this proverb opens up the proverb. And if you, I'd encourage you at some point this week, tonight, maybe before you go to bed, look at Proverbs 3. 
And if you look at Proverbs 3, the first two-thirds of the Proverbs says this is a person who's devoted to God. This is the qualifications of their life, the characteristics of their life. This is how they conduct themselves. This is how they interact with other people. And so it paints the picture of a wise person. But you know what? The last third of Proverbs, and this is in the last couple sentences of Proverbs, talks about the person who is double-minded and is not faithful to God. And so in the Proverbs, the first two thirds, great stuff. The second third, it says that these type of people, the type of person who, it, who God opposes, that's under the summary of proud, is a plotter of evil, a wicked person, a violent person, a perverse person, a foolish person. You can check my work, look at Proverbs three, you'll see it in there. And the reason that we know that this figure of speech was employed is because it wasn't just James that did it. Peter does it too. Peter quotes this exact proverb in the letter he wrote to Christians. In 1 Peter 5, last part of verse uh, 5 of 1 Peter 5, Peter says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Slightly different wording, but the same idea. And so what James does and what Peter does is he employs this little device, this little doohickey of saying, may the force be with you. And so everyone's thinking of, in this case, Proverbs 3 and all of it. And so, so when James says, God opposes the proud, lights came on for the people reading this. You see, as I mentioned, they, they were kind of super Christians. They had grown up in the Hebrew tradition. They had grown up reading the Proverbs. They were familiar with all of this. And so when he writes this, it opens up. And so as we talk about pride tonight, I already warned you, this isn't being kind of full of yourself. This is something far more sinister and dark. I want us to, I want us to define what this kind of pride is. Let me explain what it is. And I, I just kind of came up with a little definition that might help us. This is my definition. This isn't deep theological definition, but here's my definition. Pride in the Bible refers to the internal conviction that I know best, that I know best. And this kind of pride, it places the self on the throne that rightfully belongs to the God who is there. Catch, catch the difference there? When we think of pride, because sometimes the Bible, you read the Bible, it says, don't be prideful. And you're like, well, what about good work? I did, I did something good. Can't I take pride in my work? Yes, you can take pride in your work. That's fine. That's not sinful. But if you think that you accomplished all the work on your own because you are an amazing person, now you're coming real close to the theological definition of pride. When you begin to think of yourself as an independent operator, maybe God's a consultant, but God is not the center of your world. He's just someone that from time to time you, you go to. This is the type of pride that James is warning his readers about. So if, if that's the definition of pride, how do I know if that is operative in me? So we'll back up and we'll start in the first verse of chapter four because James starts with the evidence before he gives us this verse. Here's, here's where he starts. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but uh, do, do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you ask with, well, the wrong motives. You don't receive because you ask with what? The wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now he starts out in verse one, he says there's a desires within you. And then at the end of verse three, he says, you spend on your own pleasures. And the old Greek word there is the same exact word that the English word hedonism comes from. Hedonism is this wanton desire. Initially in the old ancient language, it just meant to desire something very deeply. But over time, just like today, words migrate in meaning. And so hedonism, which started out like, hey, I just desire something good. I desire something pleasurable, turned into something dark and it turned into something sinister. 
couple generations ago, your grandparents' generation, there was a comedian, Flip Wilson. And you can even watch him on YouTube. It's not funny, by the way. Uh, comedy sometimes doesn't work generation to generation. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I watch old Flip Wilson and I think, people paid money to see this guy? But he would have this little refrain. He would say, the devil made me do it. And believe it or not, it brought the house down. People thought it was hilarious. There was one chuckle in the room when I said, the devil made me do it. All of us are like, yeah, whatever. But when Flip did it, it was hilarious. And, and the problem that most of us have when we're dealing with the darker desires of life is we think they're external to us. That when, when we own up to the desires that are coming out, we go, well, devil made me do it. Or he made me do it. Or the situation made me do it. Or my upbringing made me do it. And what James, James has none of it. James says, when you do things from a dark and sinister place, it comes from your own internal desires, which by the way, if you've been tracking with this whole series, this is what James has said since chapter one. Don't blame God. Don't even blame the devil. You gotta look in the mirror. And so James says, from the, the desires within you. And so it causes what he says, he, he says it causes fights and quarrels among you. In other words, it it causes relationship tensions. And so here's a diagnostic question. If you're honest, do you have relationship tensions in your life that you are party to? I don't mean you are you the victim of, because there is some of that. But what I'm asking and what James is driving at is there is a type of problem with other people that we get ourselves into because I want something and they won't comply. I want something a certain way and they don't understand how I want it. And so inside, something boils and something erupts. And now we're in a, we're in a fight. And so James goes on and he says, you know that your desire and you don't have, so what do you do? You kill. Just quick show of hands. How many of you committed a homicide at some point? Hopefully no hands. If you raise your hands, see security afterwards. We have some questions for you. James is picking up on the teaching of Jesus. So Jesus in, uh, it's sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters five, six, and seven are the Sermon on the Mount. You'll hear sometimes the Sermon on the Mount. That's where it's located. It's in Luke two. Mark mentions it, but Matthew really has the big Sermon on the Mount. And just like any good teacher, Jesus repeated himself. The Sermon on the Mount probably was not a one and done message. This was a continual message. And one of the key legs of Jesus' teaching is about what happens inside you and how that's as important as what happens outside of you. And so what James seems to be saying isn't that they're, you know, they're having a church gathering and there's a worship service and then someone ends up upset so they stab and kill the other person. That's probably not what James is saying. What James is saying is akin to Jesus' teaching. Matthew 5, this is what Jesus said. You've heard it said to the people long ago. You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry, and now he's not talking about like minor league anger. He's talking felony level anger, rage, malice. That person that person who's angry with their brother or sister will be subject to the same judgment as the person who does actual murder. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, if you think such thoughts about those other people, you're killing them. And so James says, um, not only do you get into scuffles and there's relationship tensions, but you actually, in your mind, take a life. And I know, you're going, I've never done that. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you, you had a friend and something went down that now you have your regrets over, but you don't talk anymore? How, no show of hands. How many of you have passed along a bit of gossip that you aren't exactly sure if it's true, but it's about a rival and it makes you look good? It committed some kind of murder there. How many of you, pat, no show of hands. How many... How many of you have passed along a bit of gossip that is true, 
whether you're betraying a confidence or otherwise, but it still makes you look good and makes your rival look bad. And James is saying that that situation internally, that is corrupt. That is not good. And if, if you have the relationship tensions and the quarreling, and if you have a series, uh, if, if there is a graveyard of former friends in your backyard, then, then that's evidence of pride. Then he mentions just plain old coveting. Now, it would be one thing if he just mentioned relationships because that'd be fantastic. I mean, some people do really great with relationships, but then he mentions this internal desire, coveting. The old British theologian, Pastor John Stott, passed away about 15 years ago. I cannot recommend enough his books. John Stott with two T's at the end. He says, envy is the reverse side of a coin called pride. And, and so James is getting into this. He's saying, you envy, but what's envy? Envy is the reverse side of a coin called pride. Envy says, I deserve that. That should be mine. If, I, if it wasn't for their lucky breaks, I would have what they have. In fact, they don't deserve any of that. I do. And so James says, when you covet, you're, you're, you're betraying an internal sense of, of, of your own entitlement. This is a type of evidence of pride in your life. And you go, but I don't, I don't covet. I mean, I... I might wish he was my boyfriend or she was my girlfriend or I had that job. But I mean, it's not really coveting. I mean, I might think about it from time to time and I keep that secret journal where I write about it. But I mean, nobody knows about any of that. It's password protected. And James says, when you covet like that, that is a, that is a sure giveaway. And then um, he mentions as he started with quarrel and, and, and fighting. And sometimes we, we look at like quarreling and fighting and, and we take something like this and mean, well, so Christians should never disagree. And that's not what James is saying. Think about what James is doing. He's actually writing a book that's argumentative. He's writing a letter where he's forcefully expressing an opinion that some people will not appreciate. He is stirring up quarrels and fights, but they're the right kind. And so here we have a beautiful example of how to go about telling the truth in a person's life. James is, James is giving us a bit of a, a, a master class of the craft. He's sticking with the point. So he might be stirring up what could be a hornet's nest. If I'm a pastor of a, a flock of people who grew up in the synagogue and in uh, Asia Minor, and then they all come to Christ, and now I'm their pastor. Maybe I was their rabbi, and now I'm their pastor. And I get this letter from James. There's no question. It's going to stir some stuff up. Some people are going to be angry. It is okay to stir some stuff up for the right reasons, with the right principles. But James is saying, if you just like to create conflict, if you're just so strongly opinionated, politics, the economy, businesses, the environment, whatever. You name your pet issue. This is my hobby horse issue and I like to ride it into town all the time. And when I do, I go looking for an opportunity to just get into it with people. We all know those folks. Some of us are those folks. But right now, as I describe that person, you're like, I work with them. I, if they're out by the coffee machine, I just go to the bathroom. If they're in the bathroom, I go to the parking lot. I, I am not crossing paths with that person. They're always into something and they're, they're never happy. Well, that's an example of pride and the wrong kind of pride. This isn't pride in handling things well. This is, this is saying, look, I'm the ultimate authority in the universe and you will listen to me. And, and so um, then James goes on and he invokes an interesting marriage metaphor only in the darkest corner of marriage. This is what he says, this is verse four. He says, you adulterous people. Nah, 
I don't know about you, but I feel good that James is writing to people that are long dead and not to me. That's a pretty ugly word. But James says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God or hostility against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now that's a little less comfortable. There are many verses I read in the Bible, and I've mentioned this before here. I've mentioned it when I preach. I mention it when I teach. There are verses in the Bible that if I was given a vote, I would vote it off the island. This is kind of one of them. I kind of want to have a, like a, like a, at least an acquaintance with the world. Like I want to have like a good friend, like a BFF with God. And then I want to have like a, occasionally we go out to drinks relationship with the world. I think we all do. And what James is saying is that you can't put a foot in the world and you can't put a foot in your relationship with God. And he uses this interesting term of friendship. Now for us, we, we hear friendship and you're like, well, friendships come and go, it's no big deal. We all have friends that we're like embarrassed about or we're the friend someone else is embarrassed about. You know, friendship is different in our culture, but in an ancient culture and in a culture of honor and shame, in an ancient culture, your reputation would be intertwined with your relatives and your friends. And why this is significant here is that you would never have a friendship with someone who by association you could look bad. Now, this is a weirder one for us to sort of get our minds around because one is there is a Christian teaching. We, we shouldn't just guard our own reputations. And so what James isn't saying is, is don't rub shoulders with people out there outside the faith. What he is saying is that in the life of a believer, there should be such a remarkable difference is that when we're out there, if we can use that term, we look different. We talk different. We carry ourselves different. We might dress different. I don't mean like sew your own clothes Amish stuff. I mean like we would just be the kind of folks that other people look at and go, they're not like everybody else. They don't, they don't live together before they get married. They don't, they don't even do the hookup thing from time to time. When we go out places, they never, they don't get drunk. Are they, when we tell sort of like some of those little more edgy stories or jokes or whatever, they, they, they just sort of hang back a little bit. And so what James is depicting here is friendship with the world is the person who's like, hey, when I'm with my friends in the world, don't tell God about it because it'd be best, best if he didn't know. But when I'm in church, I am raising my hands and I'm so full of the spirit in that moment. This is great. And God sees through this. What James is saying is, is you might fool the people over here. They may be like, that is a great person. So fun to be around. But when you get over here and you're like, ah, God's going, yeah, I'm not having it. I'm not listening right now. We're not okay. Even if in the moment, everybody around go, so faithful, so faithful. And so James says, the type of person that practices or attempts to practice a deep and abiding friendship with the world, that person is so full of pride. Remember what pride is. Pride is putting myself on the throne that God rightfully belongs on. So if I'm rightfully on, if God's rightfully on the throne, but I'm occupying that big chair, guess what? then I am invoking my own law and my own rules. And God from time to time gets a little bit. So, um, so what's interesting here is that uh, a couple different times, uh, James is invoking Old Testament prophetic language. And if you immerse yourself in the Old Testament, you smell it. And if you don't, you don't. And it's okay because you enjoy it just as it sits. But as you get deeper into it, you realize, okay, so when he talks about friendship with the world and when he uses this language of, 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 of adulterous, what does he mean? Because he's not necessarily talking to people who are sexually active and committing some form of adultery as in the Ten Commandments. No, Old Testament prophets regularly invoke the term adultery to describe the broken relationship between God and his people. 
I'll just illustrate it with one passage and then, um, and then just a little metaphor that might help us resonate or understand it. This is Jeremiah, Old Testament prophet, major prophet, wrote a big long book, I highly recommend. Jeremiah three, this is what he says. And he's, Jeremiah is speaking for the Lord here. And this is the Lord. I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land? This is God talking to his people. The, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. And there's this picture of, of an adulteress. Now, um, just a metaphor that might help us lock it in. So, um, so let's say tonight you meet the person of your dreams and, and you stick around after. Some of you, I sit in the back oftentimes and some of you get out of here so fast you can't meet the person of your dreams when you leave early. Wait till it's over. Mix and mingle. I'm not saying you will. I'm saying you might. But let's say you meet the person, you're, oh, they're so charming. He's amazing. She's amazing. And so tonight you meet for the very first time and oh, it's electric. And then you Sabbath, you go on a date and it even gets better. And you go on another date. And before too long, you, you define your relationship and you're exclusive. And it is, it, you, you then go to Becoming One, which is our premarital program. It's a, over a long weekend or it's over a, a series of weeks, but it really prepares a couple well. It covers all the important subjects, by the way, a free commercial. And you go to Becoming One and then you get connected to a pastor who sits down and does some premarital counseling with you. And then Finally, the date is set. Some of you are getting so eager right now. I can see it in your eyes. Your eyes are lighting up. But you, you, you set the date, and, and it's an Instagrammable wedding. It's everything a wedding is supposed to be today. It's bespoke. It's unique. There's twine or something organic. You grow the flowers yourself. You give away. Every, everybody gets a petunia. Whatever it is that people do today. Um, and so you're, it's, it's just lovely. And then you go and you go on a honeymoon. I took my wife, by the way, 26 years ago on our honeymoon, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. If you wanna know if a person really loves you, take them there. <laughs> I know, some of you are like, I'm so jealous. You could, inst no, there's nothing you can Instagram in the Upper Peninsula. They did have a Wendy's up there. But, <laughs> but let's say after all this, finally you set up house, you have like a perfect little house and wherever it is, perfect little house are, it's great. It's all stuff, it's really neat. And then, um, and then like, um, like a few months in, your perfect like dream partner, they just don't even talk to you anymore. Except every like two weeks, all of a sudden they just gloat all over you and give you like an obscene amount of attention for like three hours. They're like, they're like all excited and they're looking at you and then, and then like two weeks go by before that kind of attention. But in between there's the occasional text like money's low, put it in the account please. Uh, dirty laundry, fix it, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then, and then uh, you're kind of obviously, would you feel good at this point? No, so you go out, some of you are like, oh, I don't know, it depends. I, um, it depends, did he put money in the account? Um, so, so then you finally get to, you finally get to the, you know, and, and you go out and, and, uh, and then you see him or her and they're just draped over another person. Do you think deep down inside, this is great. I look forward to another five decades of this. Or do you think, anyone know an attorney? And yet we expect God to put up with that. I mean, just, we expect God to put up with that. Hey, 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 God, I knocked the ball out of the park this month, went to church three out of four Sundays. Whoop -woo. I not only... I gave you a little tip in the offering plate. That was a $25 service this week. I mean, I mean, the music was good. The sermon went too long, but you know what? Can't take the money back once it's in the plate. And we think, shouldn't that be enough? I mean, he's the creator God of the universe. What's his big deal? What's his hang up? I should be able to just ignore and neglect him and he should never think of that as unfaithfulness. He should think of me as quite remarkable. And James says, that's an adulteress. That's the kind of person that doesn't care about God. They, they care about themselves. And, 
And so he moves from, he moves from this evidence of pride operating in a life, this sort of two-faced approach, this inconsistency in relationship. The relationships around us, humanly speaking, are somewhat in shambles. There's anger and antagonism and bitterness and resentment and coveting. And then just to sort of give a case study towards the end of the fourth chapter, he says, uh, here's an example of what this kind of person looks like. He says, um, he says uh, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city. We'll spend a year over there and then uh, we'll carry on business. We'll make a lot of money. It'll be great. And James says, why, you don't even know. You don't even know what's gonna happen tomorrow. What, what is your life? You're like a mist, it disappears. You're like a puff of smoke and gone. And you're making all these plans, like you're God. No, no, he says, instead you ought to say, if, if the Lord wills, it, we'll live and do this or that. A, a, as it is, you, you boast in your arrogant, your arrogant schemes. All such boasting, James says, is cute and adorable. No, actually, what's he say? All such boasting is what? Oh, come on, it's on the screen. All such boasting is what? Evil. James doesn't mess around. This is why, this is one of my favorite books that I came into contact with in my teenage years, changed my life, and part of the reason is James talks like normal people. He's like, I'm calling it for what it is. I'm not fooling around. That kind of thinking is evil. So he pictures a person. And I know some of you are like, I'm a planner. Is James saying I can't plan ahead? I plan ahead. He's not saying you cannot plan ahead. James is also not just affirming that fly by the seat of your pants because some people read this like, that's totally me. I make no plans whatsoever. Very godly person. No, not necessarily. Maybe, maybe not. No, what James is saying is there's a type of person that just decides what they're gonna do with their life and they just ignore everything else. They don't take God into consideration, but instead, what we ought to do is say, if the, if the Lord is in this. Now, it's not a magic incantation, by the way. I grew up in a church where there was always that one person like, well, y'all just say, Lord wills, Lord wills, Lord wills. And I'm like, you are nothing like the Lord, man, so don't do that. This isn't just a little frosting you put on an otherwise selfish cake. This is a whole life expression that says, my life is bound up in the Lord and what, is, what it is he wants for me, that's what I want for me too. Even if I don't want that for me, I will want that for me because that's what he wants for me. Okay, so what do we do about it? Because right now I know some of you are like, I come out on a Tuesday night to be encouraged and this wasn't. So how do we respond to this? Let's go back to the verse that kicked us off. This is um, that proverb, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. God, um, God opposes the proud. That word favor, it, 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 most of the time in the New Testament is translated um, grace. Uh, God opposes the proud, he gives grace. He shows grace to the humble. And, and it's important for us to remind ourselves of this one, that we don't do more better we don't fix it through willpower. We don't focus more on the issues or try to make ourselves smaller and God bigger. All those strategic kind of things maybe work, probably don't. We need God's grace. We need his help in this. And, and so what he does is he, he shows us, James shows us how we can engage our faith, how we can engage our faith in, a, in, a, in God in a way to eradicate this pride. And so here it is. And this is, by the way, just a little, a little side. James Chapter four, verses seven through 10. These are four of my favorite verses in my life because these, you might not have a problem with pride, but you might have a problem with envy. You might have a problem with, with coveting. You might have a problem in relationships. You might have a problem with vanity. You might have a problem with anger, but this, these four verses will help you deal with that too. And so um, if James... If James was a, 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 like a social media influencer, he would call this eight practical steps to break free from the world. But let me read it, and then we're gonna run through those steps real quick. This is what James says, submit. You got a problem with this? You got pride in your life? You got uh, vanity in your life? You're angry at people in your life? 
submit yourselves then, or the word is therefore, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. What? Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now this, this little section right here, there's like eight little steps. And this is the closest thing the Bible gets to a formula to dealing with the sin in your life. But by God's grace, this can help anyone. This has helped me, it can help you. So let's run through these steps. The step that it starts with is submit to God. You, you, you submit to God, you voluntarily place God on the rightful throne of your life. And, and every one of us, there is a throne room in your life, whether you can visualize it or not. There is a throne room in your life and on in that throne room, there is a throne. And if God doesn't sit on it, you sit on it. And so if God doesn't take center stage in your life and you orient your life around him and his wishes and his designs for your life, it will be you on the throne. The old Protestant reformer, John Calvin, he had a little seal that he would seal his letters with. And it was a symbol. It was a symbol of a hand holding a heart. And later, before he died, he began to use the actual expression. And the expression was, to you, O Lord, I offer my heart promptly and sincerely. Now, Calvin was a faith-filled man. He was a an author of much theology, and his expression was, God, I give you my heart, and I give it to you now. I, I am submitting myself to you. And so the first step along the way is to submit to God in a real and meaningful way. Step two, resist the devil. How many of you love October? September, October, fall of the year? Bunch of you do? Okay, um, I have a love-hate with fall. I love fall because football is back. I hate fall because it's horror movie season. How many of you like horror movies? See me after I'll cast the demons out. Um, <laughs> I'm, it's, so I, I, I hate that time of year because I'm watching a football game and they're like, you're gonna have a nightmare. And, and they show a commercial. And there were two this year that if you saw them, see me really afterwards because you need help. Um, one was a, a movie called Smile and it seemed very nice, but it was not about people that were happy. You would get possessed just by seeing someone smile. It was terrible. And I picked this up from the commercial and I thought, I gotta look away. And then the other is the world, the world does not need any more Halloween movies. There's been 477 of them. If Jason Voorhees was in Oklahoma, he would have died in the first one because they would have shot him to death, okay? So I'm not, an, I'm not advocating violence, okay? I'm just saying those movies, here's the problem with those movies. We're like, ah, ah the devil, he's creepy, he's scary. He's not. If he puts a chill up your spine, then you're not seeing the devil. You're seeing some stupid Hollywood movie. He's an angel of light. If you bumped into him, he's handsome. He is beautiful. Charming, witty, tell you everything you need to know. When, um, when Jesus encounters him, he tells Jesus everything Jesus wants to hear. You're hungry? You can make food. Uh, you, you, you're here to be worshiped by everybody? I can make it happen. You, you are so powerful. I can see through what it is, this thing you're wearing. I know that if you jump off the cliff, the Father will protect you. It's all true. He didn't say anything untrue and he will tell you, you deserve it. I can't believe they're holding this back from you. God never really said that. Did God really say that? By the way, that's his first one. And he still says it and people still fall for it. And here's what's interesting. James says, resist the devil and he will scamper away. And most of the time we have problem with him is we just don't even resist him. We're like, oh, I am powerless against you. And James says, he says, you, you, you submit to God, you resist the devil, and then step three, draw near to God. And here's my encouragement to you. Do a little inventory of your day, your week, your life. How much time does God get? I mean, seriously, how much time does God get? 
You ever feel like, I have no time for devotions. I have no time for a quiet time with God. Oh, that's good. That's a, that's a good one. I'm sure he'll take that one well. We have time. We have time for the priorities of our life. And so James says, if you want victory over an area of your life, you draw near to God. But most of the time, it, we might do step one. We might do step two. But step three, you gotta fill the void of your life with something more meaningful. And James says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And then step four, Step four, he says, wash your hands, you sinners. And I like that James doesn't say, wash your hands, you people who kind of miss the mark from time to time. Wash your hands, you folks that are, well, nobody's perfect. He just calls it what it is. Again, James is street level kind of guy here. And he says, wash your hands. In other words, step four, get rid of, edit out, eliminate temptation. If the smart phone causes you issues, get a dumb one. If the internet causes you issues, get some help, some protection from that. If that channel, the cable, that app causes you issues, then guess what? Dump it. Ruthlessly eliminate it. If that person is a temptation for you and every time you walk by their cubicle, you kind of lock eyes with each other and you know that's not a good thing, go the long way around. Wash your hands. This is the outward stuff. And then he says there's an, there's an inward stuff. He says, um, he says to, to purify your hearts, you double-minded. And this is to focus your heart on God. This is the internal. You, you can't, James is saying, you can't love God and the world. Don't be double-minded. Know inside what you're capable of and turn it over to him. Be all in on him. Don't keep a little corner of your life out. And then step six, lament over your sin. There's a, there's a great story in the Old Testament. It's the book of Ezra. And I'll warn you right now, if you read Ezra, like half of it's genealogy, boring. But there's half, I, mean, oh, I know it's God's inspired word. It's not boring, but it's a bunch of names and they're very, very riveting to read. But there's a part of Ezra that is narrative as it's called. And there's this part where Ezra, he's a priest. He grew up in Babylon. He, he grew up away from the promised land. He dreamed of coming back to the promised land. He gets to the promised land. Once he gets into the promised land, he thinks this is gonna be awesome. We're gonna rebuild the temple. We're gonna worship God. We're gonna rebuild this nation through faithfulness. And he gets there and all the people that have come back are replicating every single thing that got him deported to Babylon to begin with. So he went from thinking this is gonna be amazing like mountaintop experience to he realizes, oh dear Lord, we're going to end up in captivity again because these morons. And so they tell him what happened. Ezra, he's the priest. And you know what he does? Let me just read it because it's beautiful. When I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe, so like all my clothes, and then I pulled out some hair from my head and my, just imagine this scene. Imagine like your boss, wherever you work, is like super frustrated because your quarterly profits are done and just starts tearing out reams of hair. At that point, you'd, what would you do? You'd be like, I'm just gonna update LinkedIn, right? And, and, uh, and, and Ezra rips out his hair and, he, and it says he sat down appalled. Do you feel that way about your sin? Or you're like, well, it is kind of cute. Could you, could you experience Ezra's emotion about the failures? And James says, if you wanna see progress in your life, then lament it. And then, and then uh, step seven is, is change your laughter into mourning. Nothing, in other words, nothing cute about it. Grieve about this. And then finally, step eight. He says, humble yourselves and the Lord will lift you up. Humble yourselves, humble yourselves. It's close to where he began, submit to God, but this is taken on a different tone. It's to humble yourself. It's to remind yourself whose you are. You see, the question most of us ask is, who am I? And we derive our identity out of a handful of things. Who am I? I'm the person who works for this company. And some of you work for some fabulous companies. 
And for some of us, I say who I am based upon my occupation. And I know some of you. Some of you have some pretty respectable careers. And some of us, we, we say, well, this is who I am based upon my athletic prowess. That's me, by the way. You didn't have to laugh. I mean, you could have let that one go, right? But nobody cares who you are. Now, I'm not trying to be rude, I, but who you are fades. The company you work for someday won't be a company anymore. It, it might outlive you, but it's not gonna outlive the world. And the career you have at some point, trust me, at some point, you're on the, if you are on the cutting edge of everything right now, at some point there's gonna be conversations about how to move you aside to make room for somebody else. It's gonna happen. And for those of you who are like premier athletes, we can't wait for you to go to pot. Okay, there was no laughter over that one. Okay, I'll move on. We, we fade. Who we are fades, but whose we are matters. Back in the 1500s, there was a, there was a catechism. A catechism is like a, a curriculum. And it, first, catech, first question and answer of what's called the Heidelberg Catechism. It says, um, what is your only comfort in life and death? And I ask you, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the catechism answers the question because it's teaching some rich theology. And what the catechism says is, my only comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but, but I belong body and soul both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So here is my question, and as we go into 120 seconds, as we go into a time of reflection, here's the question. Do you belong to him? Because that's really the question that James is getting at. The, the pride issue is, I belong to me. And that's how we're born we're born belonging to ourselves. But do I belong? Do I belong to him? And I'm gonna close this in prayer and as we go into this time of self-reflection, ask yourself, whose? Whose am I? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this uh, challenging chapter, though there's parts of it we would take issue with if we're honest. We wish in our heart of hearts that uh, we were commended far more than we were challenged. But we know it's a gift from you. We know your word is a gift to make us, not just the people you want us to be, but the people you crafted us to be and the people that ultimately will be most joyful being once we submit to you. And so give us honest space of reflection to know who we really belong to.